So wonderful to be here uh, with all of you today. So I want to start with uh, a question. How many of you have, how many of you have the drive or how many of you have parents who in the last one month have told you, Beta, you have to be the school topper, right? You have to improve your grades. All right, you've all had that. Uh, next slide. So maybe I'll begin by suggesting how exactly do you do that, okay? Uh, we all want to be the best versions of ourselves. And there's one researcher, a gentleman by the name of Cal Newport, who is a renowned educational researcher and author. And he did a study on school toppers across high schools and colleges in a wide variety of settings. And he tried to find out what exactly do the best students do that no one else does? What is the differentiating factor? What is the unique value that they provide? And next slide. What he discovered was that over 80% of students all practiced one technique. And it's a technique so simple, but so powerful, and something that every one of you can do right here, right now. The secret is very simply to learn by teaching. And what a lot of these students do is, when they finish a lesson, when they finish a chapter, they just get up in front of the room with a whiteboard or a chalkboard, even if the room is absolutely empty. It's even better if you have a younger brother or sister or mom or dad or na na nani, right? And teach that concept to an empty room out loud. You just do that and then you very quickly identify what the gaps in your learning are. And you know what exactly you have to study. You assimilate the information at a much deeper level, right? So I hope that all of you start doing that uh, today itself, okay? Now, why am I telling you this? Well, we at Athena, we've been mentoring high school students for a few years now, and we are obsessed with one question. How do we help high school students, young people in general, be their absolute best in every possible way, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, physically even, right? How do we get them to push themselves, and how do we create an environment and an infrastructure that supports them? And that's what my talk today is about how do we create optimal educational environments and what does the dream school of tomorrow look like and sound like. So if I were to tell you imagine a dream school of the latter half of the 21st century, what are the first words or phrases that come to your mind? Anyone? Dream school of tomorrow. What about you? Free to do whatever you feel like. Uh, how about you? Yes, you. Yes, either one. Same thing. Come on, somebody else. Okay, we'll come back to you. Yes. Allowed to study your favorite subjects. Okay, wonderful. All of these will be incorporated. Uh, we have some thoughts on this, and this is by no means comprehensive, nobody can outline a full educational platform. It's a very uh, large and complex problem and a lot of people are working on it. But here are just some thoughts so that you all can start thinking about designing your optimal educational environments. Next slide. Okay, so there are really three parts to education. This comic has no relevance uh, to my talk, but I thought it would be funny, okay? There are three parts to education, okay? And helps to memorize this. Curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. Curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. Curriculum is the content. Pedagogy is the means by which information is transmitted from teacher to student. And assessment is assessing how well that information was absorbed and assimilated. Okay? So think about it in these three parts. We have thoughts on all three of them. Starting with curriculum. Next slide. Okay? So the question we get asked a lot is, do I go deep 
or do I go broad? Right? Do I study one thing and become a master of that? Almost in exclusion to everything else? Or do I dabble in as many things as possible? Do I expand my mind? Do I expose myself to everything from STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, to the arts and humanities? So over the years, you know, initially I was not sure how exactly to answer that, was very hesitant, but now I have an answer that I am sure will resonate with all of you. The answer is go broad by going deep. Go broad by going deep. How do you do that? By going deep into one subject, you can then explore the connections between that subject and almost every other subject. And I'm so confident of that, I can give you an example, right? Give me any subject. Shout it out. Give me a specific science. Uh, uh, so politics, okay, fine. That's, uh, so you think politics is one subject, but if you go deep into politics, there's a significant connection between politics and economics, right? Politics is driven by economics. For example, I mean, for elections you need uh, uh, you need campaign financing. There's economic policy that influences political outcomes. Okay, so there's a connection between politics and economics. There's also a, now increasingly a connection between politics and mathematics because a lot of campaigns are running big data analytics. They're trying to understand their demographics in a mathematical manner. There's a connection between politics and art. Right? If you want to design um, uh, political campaigns with everything from slogans to um, uh, visual media, you need to have a very refined aesthetic sense. Right? Uh, now, increasingly with uh, technology, I mean, technology is transforming how campaigns are run. In another way, history, understanding the historical backgrounds of different demographic groups and how that influences their political behavior. So, to go deep into politics, you have to understand economics, history, art, technology, and half a dozen other subjects to do it well, right? And I can say this about anything. Take computer science. How many of you are our technologists here. So a lot of people think that computer science is just about coding, just about programming. Nothing is further, I mean, not nothing, but uh, it's not entirely true. So take computer science. In order to develop an amazing app, it's not just about the coding. Of course, you have to write the code, but ultimately your app has to interface with a human. So that's where the UI UX comes in. User, uh, user interface and user experience, right? How does a human interact with a machine, interact with technology, and how do you make that as seamless as possible? That's a design question, that's not a coding question, right? So you have to understand that, you have to understand art and design, aesthetics. On top of that, you have to think about how to monetize your app. Are you going to charge for it? Is it gonna be a freemium uh, model? Are you going to um, uh, charge people to advertise? How exactly do you plan to monetize? There's the economics and business angle to that. Are you filing for a patent? There's the legal and even political angle with the regulation and so on, especially with uh, conversations surrounding uh, privacy. So there's a connection to law and politics. On top of that, you have to understand, you have to build something that society actually wants. What's the point of building an app that no one really uses? So you have to understand social trends. How do people use technology? What are their needs? Not just what they would like to have, but what, do they, what must they have? What's missing from their lives and how can your app fulfill that need? So there's sociology and psychology there too. So again, something as seemingly unidimensional as app development is connected to half a dozen different domains. So what you can do is, by going deep into app development, you can explore the connections between the programming and all these other disparate fields. And that's the way you can reconcile this depth versus breadth question. Does that make sense to everyone? Did I satisfactorily answer that question? Is anyone still in doubt? Okay, great. All right, next slide. 
So that's part one to curriculum, right? Of course, um, I mean, all of you have to take a diversity of uh, subjects, but you're going to have one or two favorite subjects. Go deep into that, but explore the connections between that subject and other subjects. So that's part one. Part two, and this is something I feel very strongly about. So when I was in high school, uh, we had something called a service learning requirement. We had to complete 40 hours of uh, service learning uh, on any issue of our choice. And uh, we couldn't graduate if we, unless we completed those 40 hours. So uh, I looked around uh, and I stumbled upon a veterans hospital close to where I grew up. And a veterans hospital is a military hospital. Now this was in 2000 something. So all the um, veterans were American World War II veterans. And if you know me, you know that I love military history, especially World War II history. I've watched every single um, uh, World War II movie. So here I was in this veterans hospital speaking with the veterans. I met people who were there in Pearl Harbor, met people who were there uh, in D-Day, people who celebrated uh, victory in Europe Day, who had fought the Nazis, people who had been on uh, numerous bombing campaigns in the Pacific against the Japanese, and one gentleman who was part of the air fleet that uh, dropped the first nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. So this supplemented everything I learned in the classroom about World War II and about the experience of soldiers. Now I had not only secondary information, but also primary information, a primary source, multiple primary sources. And that deepened my learning uh, to a great extent. And it also alerted me to the problems that the Veterans Affairs Hospital and healthcare in uh, the US in general were experiencing. And I would not have developed such an intuitive, immediate understanding of those problems had I not immersed myself, had the school not mandated it. So this concept of immersive learning, and more specifically immersive problem solving, I think is an essential component to curriculum. Because of course theoretical knowledge, the frameworks you absorb through books are essential but they must be supplemented with more unstructured learning from the real world. The real world is your real book. And if you can, there's some people who dismiss one and not the other. There's some people who are dismissive of uh, traditional education. We don't believe in that and that's not true. And there's some people who are dismissive of practical immersion. But you really need to synthesize those two. You need to go beyond the, the binary. Uh, and uh, embrace both. So that's the essence of curriculum. Okay, great. Next slide there. The next one is pedagogy. Okay, this is the manner in which information is transmitted to students. Okay, and uh, I think the, there, there are many techniques here, dozens, I can fill a classroom with them, but I think the most important one is, uh, was, uh, popularized by a gentleman named Salman Khan of the Khan Academy. You can see his picture right here. Okay, so he advocated, uh, no, what, what's wrong? I don't, oh, maybe a mistake. And so he advocated a, a concept called flipping the classroom. What does it mean to flip the classroom? I think this is a very powerful concept that a lot of schools in the future will, will adopt, which is most schools in the classroom have lectures, right? But lectures are typically a unidimensional mode of engagement, right? As opposed to a group project or something more collaborative. So uh, what he advocates is at home, watch lectures. I mean, we have such a plethora of platforms that, uh, that have online lectures from the Khan Academy to uh, YouTube EDU and Coursera. There's so many of them. So students can watch lectures at home in the comfort uh, you know uh, of their own rooms 
at their own pace. They can pause, they can rewind, they can fast forward, they can absorb that material, they can all have the same foundation, and then go ahead and come to the classroom and do something a little more engaging, right? Uh, and whenever teachers do, uh, uh, you know, have such lesson plans, it really makes a powerful impact on students. I still remember to this day one uh, uh, class in uh, American history. So what our teacher made us do was she assigned every one of us um, a, um, uh, a person from a particular uh, historical period. And uh, we essentially had to research that person and we had to come in and have, we had a, a mocktail party of sorts. And we had to act like that person and talk about our views and, um, and uh, uh, what we wanted for society. So uh, I was uh, Susan B. Anthony, uh, who is uh, a, uh, a proponent of uh, women's suffrage, women, women's voting. So yes, I did have to dress up also. I, uh, I, I looked good, I think. Okay. So, but I still remember that to this day, over 10 years ago. So imagine if, uh, uh, if such experiences were the mainstream. And I think I learned more during that one hour uh, than during any other one hour in, uh, in school. Okay, so let's, let's all thank Salman Khan for this idea. Alrighty, next one. Okay, so that was pedagogy. Okay, the idea of flipping the classroom. And I also want to talk a little bit uh, about, just uh, touch upon um, this concept of ed tech. So a lot of people believe that, um, you know, teachers will be uh, replaced by technology. That, I think, is uh, very far from the truth. Um, I think a, a sort of dual model where the teacher is a facilitator, a mentor, and guides students is essential, and that uh, will be necessary. But uh, technology can definitely play a role in supplementing educational objectives. And I think the best way to do that is through a concept called adaptive learning. How many of you have heard of adaptive learning? Okay. Not many. Right? So the whole idea of adaptive learning, and if you have a chance to engage with an adaptive learning platform, do it. Okay? So essentially the technology stands there. The technology throws questions at you, and it identifies what your weaknesses are. Okay, you're really good at this concept, but you're really bad at this concept. You're mediocre at that concept. So I won't give you this. I'll give you some of this, and I'll give you a lot of this. And when you get the easy questions right, I'll give you harder and harder questions, right? So that's an adaptive learning platform. It's a very simple um, uh, concept, but it's great if you learn it. Why is it great? Because it is the most effective and efficient ways to root out your mistakes and improve, okay? The reason a lot of students don't do it, and I hope none of you do that, is that it's frustrating because you're going through problems and everyone seems a little too tough for you because the software knows what your weaknesses are. But if you can overcome that discomfort and push through, you will improve most rapidly because you're working only on what you don't fully understand and you're not wasting your time doing problems that you already know, okay? So in a sense, it's like a strict teacher. We all have that tuitions teacher who kind of gives us easy problems from the beginning of the book. We do them, we feel great about ourselves, we go home, we think we're totally prepared for the test, and then the test rolls around, and you're like, what happened? Um, but what you want is the strict teacher who really pushes you, really gives you those questions that make you uncomfortable, make you want to think you're not quite sure, you have to build a process in your mind, and that's how you stretch and grow. And if you can do that with technology, all the better. Okay? So I think the key is knowing where technology helps and where technology would be limited. This is one way it really helps with assessment. Okay? Slide, I think. Uh, so that's uh, essentially it. I wanted to give you all a framework. Now, on top of this, I, want, I hope that all the students here kind of take the principles contained in this talk and try to design your own educational environments so that you 
um, uh, you have an optimal uh, learning context, right? So you know exactly what subjects to pursue. You're not afraid to jump out in the real world and get information straight from the source, right? Um, you try to collaborate with as many people, um, uh, you know, while, while learning by forming study groups or so on. And uh, you try to assess yourself in real time. Instead of waiting for a test, the other great thing about adaptive learning is that you get a real time indicator as to your performance and how well you're doing at any given point as opposed to waiting that week by week or, or month until you have an exam. You don't want to do that. Okay? You want it to be more in real time. Okay? So take some of these concepts. I hope you apply it. Um, it's always great to speak with students such as yourselves. If you want to uh, learn more about some of these uh, topics, I'd be happy to discuss them. This is really a passion of ours, so you can reach out to me at uh, this address. Thanks so much.